E. Right, here we go. Uh, let's go ahead and finish up about enzymes. We've seen, you're probably sick of it, but we've seen that proteins have very complicated shapes uh, that look like the spaghetti in Satan's favorite Italian restaurant. Uh, but they can be described, all that mess can, on four different structural levels. We talked about primary structure is the order that the 20 amino acids go in. Secondary structure is the way that local parts of that string of amino acids twist up into alpha helices or zigzag into beta sheets. Tertiary structure is the way the entire thing uh, folds into a shape. Quaternary structure is uh, the way that multiple chains of amino acids can end up sticking together to make an even larger functional unit. Um, this matters because shape is incredibly important because it determines what the protein will do. I'll mention really quickly, uh, for anybody interested in computer science, there's a lot of effort being put towards how to take the order of amino acids, the primary structure, and mathematically predict what the final shape of the protein is going to look like. And it turns out to be an extremely hard computational problem. Uh, people have been working on that for good grief, um, 30 years at least. And some progress has been made, but it's not a completely solved problem yet. Uh, very important because that could lead the way towards custom designing proteins with very particular shapes. Uh, but right now we don't fully know how to do that. Uh, there was at least one person a few years ago in our computer science department who was working on an aspect of that problem. So yeah, anybody and anybody who manages to crack how to do that is probably going to win like all the Nobel prizes. We talked about enzymes, proteins that make chemical reactions happen by lowering the activation energy that's needed to get them started. Um, like the spark that gets a fire going or the little nudge uh, that starts a um, soccer ball rolling down a hill. Uh, the substrate is whatever the enzyme operates on, and it has to fit into a space called the acted site, uh, a little like a key and a lock. Ooh, I should do this as a, as a demo sometime. I didn't think of it. But if you're ever making jello salad, right, where you have chopped up fruit embedded in jello, don't know if any of you like that stuff, but if you ever have to make some, um, don't use fresh pineapple or fresh kiwi fruit. And the reason for that is that fresh pineapple and fresh kiwi contain an enzyme uh, called papayan. Uh, fresh papaya, the fruit, does as well. And that enzyme breaks down uh, proteins. Um, one of the effects is that you can use these fruits as a kind of meat tenderizer. Uh, so if you put fresh pineapple in like a marinade, uh, you'll make the meat more tender because you'll break down some of its proteins. Uh, gelatin is also a protein. And if you put fresh pineapple, kiwi, or papaya in your jello salad, the stuff won't harden uh, because the enzymes in the fruit will break down the jello. Ta-da! Now we talked about how enzymes act how you have a substrate that fits into the active site, you can block enzymes from acting in several ways. And this is often important because you can't have enzymes just running around like rabid Pac-Man. Uh, there have to be ways you can control what they're doing. One way you can do this is competitive inhibition. Uh, two different substrates will use the same active site uh, if you do that. Uh, so here's a little model. You can have two different substrates that'll fit the active site, just like you could have two different keys that happen to fit the same lock. And if one of them gets into the active site, 
uh, the other one can't. So you can slow down a chemical reaction happening by adding something that gets in the way of the substrate that you want to slow down. You can add a second substrate um, that blocks the first from getting in. This plays out, I, I meant to delete that slide. The same information is on the next one, so don't worry about that. Um, this plays out in the way that your body processes alcohol, drinkable alcohol. Not that I'm sure that those of you that are under 21 have never tasted the stuff, but there are humans that like to drink drinks that contain ethyl alcohol. Cells in your liver break down ethyl alcohol. It can't stick around in your body because it's ultimately toxic. So cells in your liver have to break it down and it takes them several steps to do it. And every step is driven by a different enzyme, uh, much like the assembly of a car in a factory uh, takes many steps, each of which can be done by a single machine on an assembly line. Uh, so there you've got a whole line of industrial robots um, putting, uh, assembling car bodies you know, each doing one step and only that step. And it's a little bit like that when you drink ethyl alcohol. Uh, ethanol is the type of alcohol that's present in alcoholic drinks. And it looks like that. Uh, two carbons, uh, one stuck to an oxygen and then a bunch of hydrogen sprinkled around for flavor. Now, if you've got ethanol in your bloodstream, your blood passes through uh, your liver and cells in the liver crank out an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And that turns the ethanol into a compound called acetaldehyde. Uh, and that's what acetaldehyde looks like. You can see they've gotten rid of a couple of the hydrogens and that oxygen now has what we call a double bond on it. Now, acetaldehyde is still bad for you. Um, one of the symptoms of having too much acetaldehyde in your system is headaches. So you can't keep that around. Uh, so the cells in your liver create a second enzyme called aldehyde oxidase, and they convert that into acetic acid, which is the active ingredient in vinegar. Uh, you have taken acetic acid into your body every time you've had a nice tangy salad dressing. Um, acetic acid is not particularly toxic. Uh, ultimately, you can excrete that or maybe break it down into something else. But the point is that this is how, this is the basic steps for how you detoxify uh, the ethanol that you drink if you're legal. Okay, that's a very small piece of your metabolism, uh, but you can see that there's two steps and each one has its own um, uh, enzyme that catalyzes it. Bit about competitive inhibition. There's a second type of ethanol called methanol, AKA wood alcohol. Uh, it's used in a lot of industrial processes, uh, it's used as, I think, like paint thinner. I know you can get it in the paint section of your hardware store. The problem is that if you drink methanol, the methanol gets broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase because alcohol dehydrogenase can work on two different substrates, ethanol or methanol. So if you drink methanol, the alcohol dehydrogenase will take it and turn it not into acetaldehyde, but turn it into something called formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is deadly. Uh, formaldehyde will attack your nervous system and in particular your visual system, uh, which is where the expression going blind drunk comes from. Uh, if you drink wood alcohol, Alcohol dehydrogenase can't tell the difference between ethanol and methanol, and it will just turn it into formaldehyde, 
and formaldehyde will damage your vision, uh, will make you go blind. Uh, it will start damaging your motor skills. Um, people used to call this the blind staggers if somebody had been poisoned with methanol. And it will eventually give you a slight case of the death. And all because alcohol dehydrogenase can't tell the difference. So if you ever have to treat somebody that has just drunk wood alcohol, the best possible quick treatment you can do is to get them stinking, ripping drunk on ethyl alcohol. Give them all the vodka in the house that they'll keep down. And the reason is that if you have both methanol and ethanol in the system, alcohol dehydrogenase can only handle one at a time. So every ethanol it breaks down blocks a methanol from being broken down. So that will slow down the rate that your body makes formaldehyde slow enough that your body can handle it without permanent damage. So if anybody ever drinks wood alcohol, get them completely smashed. Um, if you're wondering why anybody would drink uh, wood alcohol, um, back when we had alcohol prohibition in this country, between 1919 and 1933, some people would drink wood alcohol because they were desperate uh, or because they were ill-informed and didn't know the difference. Uh, but there were also some federal agents that would deliberately add it to bootleg whiskey uh, to blind and kill people for breaking the law. So not recommended. Right. Okay, real quick. That's an actual mushroom. It's called Caprinus atramentarius, and it is edible. This is one of the ones that you can pick and serve if you know what, if you know how to recognize them. The problem is there's a substance in there that blocks aldehyde oxidase. It blocks that second step and it keeps acetaldehyde from converting into acetic acid. And what happens is just like what happens if a machine goes down on an assembly line. If you block that aldehyde oxidase, acetaldehyde builds up in the body and the result is the instant hangover from hell uh, because acetaldehyde causes a lot of the symptoms of a hangover, uh, in particular, the headache, uh, the flushed face, uh, the general feeling like something the cat wouldn't bother dragging in. Uh, a lot of hangover symptoms are caused by too much acetaldehyde in the body. And if you eat this particular mushroom, and then drink alcohol within, I think, 24 hours of eating that mushroom, the hangover from hell hits before you've even gotten drunk. Uh, your body is blocked from breaking down acetaldehyde, so it just builds up. So they're edible, but do not serve wine at the meal. And I should mention there's a couple of drugs, uh, Antabuse and Tempacil, that do the same thing. They block aldehyde oxidase. And the reason those are used is because they make the side effects of drinking incredibly unpleasant. Uh, if you're taking these and you start drinking alcohol, you get a terrible hangover before you even get a buzz. And it's used to help alcoholics uh, stop drinking. Um, it's, uh, I guess the effect is more psychological. Uh, it just makes the effects of drinking alcohol much less pleasant uh, than they used to be. Okay, jump back to the early 1900s. There's a British doctor named Archibald Garrod studying a genetic disease called alcaptonuria. Um, on the left in that picture is the urine from a patient with alcaptonuria uh, right after it's come out. On the right is urine from an alcaptonuria patient about 30 minutes after being urinated, and you note that it turns black. Uh, that black is due to a compound called homogentisic acid. Uh, most people don't pee out homogentisic acid, uh, but people with alcaptonuria do and the stuff turns black on exposure to air. 
So your pee is still yellow when it comes out of the body, but after about 30 minutes, it looks like you've just peed ink. It's more serious than that. I mean, just, you know, your pee turning black, you know, sounds like a fun party trick, but homogentisic acid builds up in the body and your kidneys try to get rid of as much of it as they can, uh, but they can't get rid of it all. And it tends to build up in the skin, the eyes, the heart, and especially in the cartilage, uh, which is why this gent has an ear uh, that is, looks like it's turning black. Uh, that's homogentisic acid building up in the cartilage. Your joints are also made of cartilage. Uh, the, the, that's the soft, rubbery, uh, you know, flexible but tough substance on the ends of your bones. Uh, if you lose the cartilage from your bones, it becomes very painful to move that joint because uh, the cartilage is the padding or the, uh, the low friction surface. And if you lose that, uh, your joints get inflamed and very painful. You've got arthritis homogentisic acid building up in the cartilage of your joints uh, damages that cartilage and affected people get severe arthritis uh, unusually young, usually in their 30s. So this is not something that's pleasant to have. It's not a very common illness, but Garrod was studying it. And it turns out homogentisic acid is produced from an amino acid called tyrosine. Now that's a model of tyrosine. Remember that carbon is so common in molecules from living things that we often don't bother to write little letters C. So everywhere you see an angle in this diagram, uh, there is in fact a carbon. So there's a carbon there and there and there and there, half a tick. And there's a carbon there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there. So everywhere you see an angle in that line, that's a carbon atom. And this is a good old amino acid because there's the amino group, and there's the carboxyl group right there. And then this, of course, is the pirate's favorite, the R group. Um, most people get more tyrosine than they need in their diets. It's a pretty common amino acid. Um, if you don't get it in your diet, you can actually make it out of a different amino acid. Um, so most people have excess and the excess is usually disposed of. So excess tyrosine goes through several steps that we don't need to get into and it's converted to homogentisic acid. The next step, homogentisic acid gets converted into this. It's called formalealacetoacetate. And then there's more steps that break down formalealacetoacetate. Ultimately, it can be burned as a source of energy. So there's lots more steps that I'm bothering to show here. But the critical one is that homogentisic acid is supposed to get converted into formalealacetoacetate. What makes this possible is an enzyme called HGD. If you must know, it's called homogentisate dioxygenase. HGD will do just fine. If that enzyme is faulty or if it's missing, if, the, if a person doesn't make HGD, then that pathway is blocked, right? The entire disassembly line breaks down, stops moving, and homogentisic acid starts building up in the body because cells no longer have a way to break it down further. So the reason people get alcaptonuria is because they're unable to make um, homogentisate dioxygenase enzyme. They can't make HGD. They can't turn their homogentisic acid to formalealacetoacetate. So the homogentisic acid just builds up and builds up 
the kidneys dump out as much as they can, but some of it ends up in the cartilage and gives people arthritis. The reason that's significant is Garrett studied families with a history of alcaptonuria, and he discovered that alcaptonuria is inherited as a simple Mendelian recessive allele. And if you have two copies of the normal gene, you don't have it. If you're heterozygous, you don't have it, but you're a carrier, you can pass it on. And if you've got two copies of the recessive allele, you have alcaptonuria. Um, he actually studied some other disorders that work like this, um, medical problems that can be traced to the absence of a particular enzyme. And they also turned out to be inherited as simple Mendelian traits. Uh, he called them inborn errors of metabolism. And his conclusion was that what a gene fundamentally was, was the instructions for making one particular enzyme, or as he put it, one gene, one enzyme. Um, and incidentally, uh, we just, I just talked about hangovers. And remember that to clean up the acetaldehyde in the body, you need to make an enzyme called aldehyde oxidase. There are some people that have inherited alleles for a less effective form of aldehyde oxidase. Their body can't make enough of that enzyme. And they're normal, but the main symptom is that they always have a bad reaction to even small amounts of alcohol. It's as if they have always eaten uh, those coprinus mushrooms. Uh, this gentleman has it. On the left, that's before, and on the right, five minutes after uh, drinking a small amount of alcohol, uh, you can see that uh, his skin has turned red, uh, and he's also probably not going to feel very good. Uh, we can't really take a photo of the headache. Uh, but yeah, there are some people who get hellish hangover symptoms within a few minutes of drinking even a small amount of alcohol, and that's because they've inherited alleles for an ineffective form of aldehyde oxidase. The instructions that they got for making aldehyde oxidase were faulty. Uh, here's another one you might have heard of, maybe. Uh, this thing that looks like, you know, Technicolor spaghetti is a diagram of an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. And right there in the middle, uh, those little, um, oh, I've got a, oh, I've got a laser pointer here. Yeah, I'm going to go with the pen. That thing right there. That's a molecule of an amino acid called phenylalanine. Uh, it's fitting right there in the active site. And this enzyme will normally convert phenylalanine to the amino acid tyrosine. If you inherit a faulty gene for this enzyme, if you don't make the enzyme or you don't make it with the right shape, phenylalanine cannot be broken down to uh, tyrosine, and excess phenylalanine builds up because that, that disassembly line is blocked. And the problem with excess phenylalanine is it starts getting toxic to your nervous system. Uh, you get a condition called phenylketonuria, and this is now tested for uh, with every newborn baby uh, in the U.S., probably in most countries. Uh, because it's very easy to test it. You add a certain chemical compound to the first wet diaper and see if it changes color or not. That's how you test for phenylketonuria. And you want to do that because that buildup of excess phenylalanine uh, will cause developmental delay if you don't catch it early. Uh, you can live with this and grow up with normal intelligence but you have to avoid foods with high levels of phenylalanine, uh, which means that, for example, 
uh, you can't drink Diet Coke. Note the warning label, phenylketonurex contains phenylalanine. Remember that NutraSweet is a molecule of phenylalanine stuck to a molecule of aspartic acid. Um, I showed you that in a previous lecture. There's aspartame right there. That's the NutraSweet. That's the sweetener in there. And if you drink lots of Diet Coke, phenylalanine builds up. You can't get rid of it, and it will start damaging your nervous system. So that's why there is that warning label there. Something to check for next time you're in, uh, in the supermarket. OK, right. We have now expanded Garrett's insight quite a bit. We define a gene as responsible for making one polypeptide chain of amino acids. So a protein with a quaternary structure, there might actually be multiple genes, each of which makes one part. And we now know that the instructions for putting amino acids in the right order are encoded in the order of the DNA bases. When you read off a strand of DNA, what you get is like A-A-T-A-G-A-G-A-C-C-C-C-A-A-T-A-A-T, or whatever, something like that. I mean, unless it's Canadian DNA, in which case it's just A, 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 A. Get it? OK. Or unless, it's, uh, or, or unless it's Spanish DNA, in which case it just goes C, 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 C. OK, sorry, sorry. Bad professor, no cookie. Bad professor, right. So the instructions for putting amino acids together in the right order is the information that DNA carries. This is what we call the genetic code. All right, you are able to assuming you don't have phenylketonuria, you're able to make this stuff, this enzyme, and break down phenylalanine in your diet uh, and turn it into tyrosine because you inherited from at least one of your parents the right instructions for putting amino acids together in the right order so that you get this. If you did not inherit instructions for putting amino acids together in the right order to get this, then you may have phenylketonuria. That's what DNA actually does. Here's the thing. In a eukaryotic cell, DNA is in the nucleus, right? The nucleus contains the chromosomes. The chromosomes are very long pieces of DNA Normally, DNA does not leave the nucleus. If the nucleus breaks open and DNA spills out, it probably means the cell is going to die. In a healthy cell, the DNA never leaves. But it was known that proteins actually get made outside the nucleus, not in it. And soon after the discovery of the double helix, uh, Francis Crick, um, who was also kind of a stuck-up guy, but not quite as sexist and racist as Watson, um, Crick proposed what he called the adapter hypothesis. The idea is the information is copied onto a second molecule uh, that shuttles out of the nucleus. Now, I used to be able to explain this very well, but technology has kind of caught up with me. Uh, but let's see if I can do this. Um, imagine that you're a really good cook and you're always trying new recipes. And you happen to be in the Torreson Library one day, UCA's library. You know what a library is. It's a, a big computer lab where there's books flying around. And you happen to be looking in the shelves of the books. I know, strange. You know, you mostly go there to use the computers, but you happen to be looking around in the books and you find an amazing recipe that you want to try. 
So you eagerly go to check out the book and you find that you have not paid your library fines for several years. So you're blocked from taking the book out of the library. Okay, what could you do? Well, maybe let's, let's pretend for a moment that you don't have your phone with you. What you could do is find a photocopy machine, make a photocopy of the recipe, stuff that in your pocket and take that with you and go home with it and actually cook up the recipe in your home kitchen. That's the way that this works. DNA stays in the nucleus and it can't leave. Uh, like a library book that you cannot check out because you have not paid your fees in years. So the information on DNA has to get copied onto something else, something that Francis Crick called the adapter. Just like the information in that cookbook could be copied onto a photocopy, and it's that copy that leaves the nucleus and goes out to where the protein is actually made. Just like it's that photocopy that you take with you out of the library to the kitchen where you'll actually make the food. Turned out that Crick was right and the adapter turns out to be the other major type of nucleic acid. Now we've talked about DNA, the other one is RNA, ribonucleic acid. You'll find RNA pretty familiar because it's a polymer of nucleotides just like DNA. However, RNA is single-stranded, um, not double-stranded. It doesn't make a double helix. It doesn't really make a helix at all. Occasionally you'll get pieces of DNA that, of RNA that'll bind with themselves and form a, a, a loop and you can have a little double-stranded section for a while, uh, but by and large, RNA is single-stranded. It's not necessarily a helix. RNA nucleotides don't contain the sugar deoxyribose. They contain the sugar ribose. RNA uses one different base. Instead of the base thymine, it uses a base called uracil which we just abbreviate with the letter U. And then RNA is routinely found outside the nucleus of a healthy, healthy eukaryotic cell. Uh, so over here on the left, uh, that's a DNA nucleotide uh, with the sugar deoxyribose and the base thymine. An RNA nucleotide contains a sugar called ribose. It's got an oxygen there, as well as there. Deoxyribose has an oxygen there, but no oxygen there. That's why it's deoxyribose. And then the RNA nucleotide instead uses, RNA uses A, G, and C, just like DNA does. But instead of thymine, it uses uracil, which you can see is missing a little group of carbon atoms uh, right there. So RNA just puts a uracil wherever DNA would have a thymine. Okay, this is starting to get just a little heavy and I might, all right, I'm gonna keep going for the next five minutes, but we'll pick up the rest on Wednesday. When you need to make a protein, it starts like this. A length of DNA in the nucleus will unzip. Remember those hydrogen bonds will break, those very weak Velcro-like bonds uh, unzip and the two halves move apart. And thanks to a bunch of enzymes that do all of this, RNA nucleotides, are assembled on one of the DNA strands to make a complementary strand. And this follows the familiar pairing rules. If the DNA strand bond, if the DNA strand has an A, the RNA strand, they'll put a U instead of a T. If the DNA strand has a T, the RNA strand will have an A. 
And then if the DNA has a G, then RNA will, that will pair with a C on the RNA and a C on the DNA will pair with a G on the RNA. So it's just like the rules that you've seen, except RNA will have a U wherever, um, whereas DNA would have a T. So now when the RNA strand is completed, it peels off and the two DNA strands get back together. And we have a piece of RNA called messenger RNA or just mRNA for short. That is analogous to the photocopy of the information in the library, the photocopy that you made and can now take out of the library with you. The process, by the way, is called transcription. So that's a diagram of what it looks like. Uh, that purple blob in the middle is a model of an enzyme called RNA polymerase. That's what's doing the actual work of unzipping the DNA strand and moving RNA nucleotides into position. That's the little machine that is doing that. And you can see the DNA strand is unzipped right where the RNA polymerase is touching it. And one of the What's up? OK, somebody's mic was on. Uh, one of those strands of the DNA, called the sense strand, by the way, is being used to make as a pattern to assemble a long piece of RNA. That's the messenger RNA. Messenger RNA will move out of the nucleus. Uh, there's a little uh, bunch of little holes in the nucleus wall called nuclear pores uh, that it can go out of. And the messenger RNA will pass to a really, really tiny structure floating around in the cell outside the nucleus called a ribosome. And each ribosome is made up of about 50 proteins and several more RNA molecules. Uh, we don't really need to get into what it's made of. It's a protein RNA complex. And there are maybe millions of ribosomes in each cell. I don't know how many, uh, but each ribosome is roughly 20 billionths of a meter long. Uh, that's 20... Um, nanometers, way too small to see with a light microscope or even with most electron microscopes. And the messenger RNA slips into a groove on the ribosome. Uh, that's what a ribosome would look like if you could see it. Uh, yes, it looks extremely complicated, but there's one subunit. It's kind of shaded blue right here. Looks like this. And another subunit that's kind of shaded purple. It looks like this. All of the spaghetti stuff is a mixture of ribosomal proteins and some RNAs that are important for holding the thing together. And right between the two subunits, there is a groove. So there is the groove. And the messenger RNA slides itself into the groove. And that's where it actually gets read and used to assemble amino acids in the correct order. I'm going to stop there, and we will pick this up on Wednesday. And we'll talk about how the amino acids know where to go um, and how you know, the amino acids know uh, that they're supposed to make like Madonna and get into the groove. Boy, you got to prove your love to me. Sorry, you can take the kid out of the 80s, but you can't take the 80s out of the kid. Uh, right, I'm going to stop recording before I embarrass myself further.